Hi, everybody. <clears throat> well, welcome to the online world and to the first installment of Chapter 11, Interactive Data Graphics. This is part one of the slides. We'll be focusing on HTML widgets today. So within the big picture of data science, we're still very much in the visualize phase. So on we go. Uh, first little HTML widget I'd like to introduce you to is just a little toy called BP Explode R, Box, po Box Plot Exploder. Here's the idea. Um, we have a data set in the uh, data package, which uh, is always attached when you start an R session. And you can look up some help on chick weights. I encourage you to do, do that. Uh, basically, it's results of an experiment where people were trying to figure out uh, what diet uh, would produce the most, most growth in baby chicks. Uh, we'll investigate some of the results with the BP Explode R package, so you'll want to library it. It is installed on the server. Um, and you want to uh, run uh, this code here. Uh, sadly, it does not show up in IO slides, but it will show up in R Markdown documents and most other formats. So um, let's give that uh, code a little uh, try ourselves. Kapoom, zoom it up. All righty. Uh, so what we've got is, um, you know, various diets like horse bean and linseed and soy, soybean, meat meal, sunflower, and casein uh, in, in the, the feed that was given to the chicks. So we've got these six groups of chicks, and they're being weighed after six weeks. And we've got box plots of the weights of all the chicks in each of these experimental groups. Um, like, notice this box plot here for the sunflower group uh, it has got some outliers. Uh, but if you'd like to see the individual values, you can just click on one of the boxes and wow, it explodes into the individual values. Woo, 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 and woohoo. And if you want to take it back, just double click somewhere inside the plot, like so. Isn't that sweet? So. That's, that's BP Explode R. It has various options that uh, you can look up, learn about uh, on the web page that I'm showing you here on this slide. It's an example of uh, what we call an HTML widget. Most of these are uh, produced um, using a JavaScript library called D3. And the HTML uh, widget's job basically is to hook these D3 libraries up to uh, regular R code. Another uh, R package that relies heavily on HTML widgets is Plotly. Uh, let's do something standard that we've done quite a few times before. Uh, we're going to make a make a data set that's glyph ready for plotting uh, the number of home runs hit each year by the leading home run hitter in each of our two leagues, American and National League. Um, and we, we're also getting uh, uh, some information so that we have, for example, the, uh, the, the, the idea of the player and the team that the player played for and so forth. So I encourage you to do the usual thing of uh, you know, running the uh, code one line at a time uh, in order to uh, understand it. Um, I guess I should have pointed out, too, that you do need to library the Laman package in order to get this to run. Okay, so um, once you got home run leaders, then um, if, you call up if you call up the Plotly package, what you'll do is you'll create a plot object. That is, you'll, you'll make the function call to some regular GG plot, and, uh, but just store it somewhere. So I've got the the name P bound to the results of this uh, plot call, and it's a ggplot object. And then the Plotly library has the uh, ggplotly function, which when applied to a plot object, produces an interactive graph. 
Um, when you hover over the points of the graph, uh, you see the uh, name of the player, the team the player played for, uh, what season it was, and uh, how many home runs the person hit. So um, how did we produce that? Well, you'll notice that, uh, of course, we have the x and y axis mapped to season and home run. These are aesthetic mappings, but we threw in, we could have thrown it in at the beginning, but it's also okay to throw it in at geome line or geome point. We threw in two more aesthetics and we just gave them many names we liked. I call them label and label one. First aesthetic is mapped to uh, name of the player. And uh, the second aesthetic is mapped to that team ID for the player. And what happens is that, uh, that Plotly looks at all these aesthetic mappings and records them in a default tooltip that goes with uh, the plot object when ggplotly is called. And that's how we got those four items showing up in a tooltip. We also get up here where I'm waving my mouse a little toolbar that lets you do things like zoom in and pan and, and zoom into a selection and so on. And, and you can also uh, reset uh, the, the graph as well uh, to its original position after zooming and panning. So sometimes it's handy. A um, couple of things I want to point out is uh, that uh, there are options to customize the tooltip, uh, and GG Plotly is good about recognizing them. So what I'm doing here is um, adding on to home run leaders a new variable called tip. And I'm using that uh, wonderful glue function inside the glue package. So tip is going to be uh, a character vector. And uh, what it's going to do is uh, say things like playing for, and then we have the, bra we have the braces, which uh, will put in the team ID. Uh, season in braces will give you the year, like 1941 or whatever. Here's name of the player, and here's how many home runs they hit. And so uh, the glue very conveniently puts that all together in a complete sentence, a different one for every uh, point on the scatter plot. At least that's the plan. Uh, how do we implement it? Well, we make our plot object. We just throw in the aesthetic text equals that tip variable that we created above in home run leaders. And then when we do ggplotly on P, we add tooltip equals quotes text, quotes text. And by the way, we can pipe that ggplotly object to a function called config in the plotly package and if we ask for display mode bar to be false in that function call, we'll get rid of the toolbar, which is a good idea this time because it's not that useful in this context. So the resulting graph has no toolbar at the top and uh, much nicer tooltips. It has these little complete sentences. So um, ggplotly is just a really good uh, function to master if that's all you ever learn out of plotly. That's great. But you can uh, do a bazillion things directly in the Plotly for R package. And um, in fact, it's a project option for you in this course to learn more about Plotly and produce uh, some nice graphs with it and, and tell us what you've learned. But uh, one just one simple example is here's home run leaders being piped into the Plotly function. And these X and Y calls here are the way Plotly does aesthetic mapping, setting up the frame for the graph. Here's another aesthetic mapping, um, creating a, a, what will ultimately be a tooltip. And uh, here's aesthetically mapping the color of points to the league the player plays from. The resulting object is piped into config and uh, display mode bar it shall be false. And so since we didn't ask for a line graph here, we've got just scatter plots. Uh, it is possible, perfectly possible to add line graphs. 
You'll notice the tooltips have a little bit different structure. The X and Y axis variables come in parentheses, and then uh, the name and the team uh, were these extra aesthetic mappings. But Plotly is pretty nice. So uh, if you want to learn more about uh, Plotly for use in R, uh, you can consult the documentation directly on the web. It's right here. It's quite extensive. Many, many good examples to copy and learn from. And there's also an entire book about Plotly that I greatly recommend. It'll really help you to understand more of what you're doing when you're working with Plotly if you invest time in reading it. Um, just a, one more example of HTML widgets. Uh, there's package digraphs. And digraphs specializes in time series plots. So those are like scatter plots, but the X variable is some kind of a time measurement, like a, a year or a date or so on. So um, let's do something familiar. Um, we're gonna create a, a Beatles data table by taking uh, baby names and filtering just for the the males who are named either John, Paul, George, or Ringo, the uh, members of the music group, the Beatles, uh, will just pull out the columns year, name, and proportion of babies of that sex born in that year with that name, the prop variable. And then we're gonna spread out the data table so that we, uh, we get uh, three separate columns, one for each of the names. And if there was a year where like there was nobody named Ringo or George or whatever, uh, and that'll occur, then uh, we'll have a zero placed in the appropriate spot. Um, so the resulting table starts off like, like this, and you can uh, scroll through. There's not that many rows. But you see what we've got is four variables, the year, and then uh, the proportion of babies named George in that year, the proportion of male babies named John in that year, the proportion of male babies named Paul in that year. And because we said Phil equals zero, we uh, are able to get zeros for Ringo here. He's not gonna show up for a long, long time. So what we'd like to do is uh, plot the popularity of their names as we've done often with uh, ggplot2, uh, but now, uh, let's try it with digraphs. So uh, we take the data table beetles that's set up in this way where each value that we want to plot against year is its own separate column, feed it into the digraph function from the digraph package, and uh, here's the title of the graph, and we pipe the resulting object into the function dirange selector and specify that the date window shall be from the year 1940 to 1980. We'll see the effect of this in a moment. Here's the result. Uh, and so uh, you see that year is indeed along the x-axis. Digraph's fairly smart. Of the four columns in that Beatles data frame, it figured out that year was supposed to go on the x-axis probably because it saw uh, these whole numbers in an order. Uh, it's not always able to tell which variable needs to go on the x-axis and not always able to tell how to order it. We'll uh, look at some of those issues and face them down in later examples. Um, the prop values are given by the three line graphs. And you notice as we drag the mouse up in this corner here, we're going to see the actual values for the proportions as well as what year we're looking at. And as you can see, uh, Ringo is like got essentially zero, zero, uh, very, zero to very few people named Ringo, but he finally gets a little popularity after the Beatles uh, hit their peak. The uh, digraph window that we set was for the years that we specified from 1940 to 1980. But remember, we have data from 1880 to about 2017 or something like that. So we can actually like ask to look at a wider range. Isn't that neat? Yeah, let me get myself out of the way. 
So we can, uh, we can widen or narrow the range as we wish. So digraphs are very pretty, very much worth a look. So if you want to learn more about them, um, there's the, the web page for the package here. And uh, you might want to look at what are some of your other options for interactive graphics. Um, there is a web page devoted to uh, HTML widgets, and folks who write an R package that makes an HTML widget will post their package there. So you can go and learn about them. There's, the, there's I think there's about a hundred of them or something, and uh, and many of them are quite uh, useful and fun. So I encourage you to look into them. Again, it's a it's a project option for this class to learn about a new R package that we don't do much with and to teach us what you've learned. So have some fun with that and I'll see you soon.